boundary. Among other things, uh, uh, one of the speakers said, uh, if it takes killing to get the black man out of the white man's streets, I say, yes, kill him. Uh, and it was all done in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, those a couple of young thugs uh, were all fired up by that oratory, and uh, and they they did go out to to get them a nigger, and uh, they shot into the the, uh, the car of the working men, and uh, Willie Brewster uh, was hit with a. Uh, a, a deer slug uh, that uh, separated his spine. Brewster died two days later. He was a hard-working man trying to support his family. It was such a senseless act and so galvanized the community that within 12 hours, $20,000 in reward money had been raised for information leading to the arrest of those responsible. The Aniston Star published, this says to Willie Brewster and to the world that he is not alone. The persons who brought him to the point of death are not just his enemies. They are enemies of us all, and we stand together in opposition to them. Not only were those people willing to give money, they were willing to go public. Three days after the shooting, the newspaper ran a full-page advertisement with signatures of Aniston's most prominent citizens asking for information about Brewster's killers. It said in part, we are determined to fight with the weapons of law to retain the dignity of this community and to punish those who struck down a respectable and industrious citizen. Therefore, we, the undersigned, pledge the sum of $20,000 to the person who supplies information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the shooting Thursday night of Willie Brewster. This reward led to an arrest and conviction. Hubert Damon Strange, an employee of a local Klan leader, Kenneth Adams, was indicted in August 1965 then convicted by an all-white jury. The verdict surprised many, including civil rights leaders who planned to protest and expected acquittal. It was historic. Strange was the first white convicted of killing a black during the civil rights era in Alabama. About the same time Strange was indicted, the Voting Rights Act became law. The landmark legislation outlawed discriminatory voting practices. I remember how my mom and dad tried several times to sign up to be registered voters, but they never made it. And I couldn't understand why. Uh, and then later years, I found out, because when the, the minute I finished high school and got ready to go to college, then it was time and I could go and sign up to vote. Well, I recall my, my father passed away in 1981 and we were cleaning out some of his papers. I should have kept the paper, I don't know why, I guess I got angry and threw it away, but that was a form, a voter registration form, and I should never forget. The only thing that that voter registration form had on it was my father's name because he couldn't complete the rest of it. The rest of it, uh, the first thing it asked for him to uh, write the preamble to the Constitution. My father had a third grade, third or fourth grade education, so he wouldn't have known that anyway. So he only signed his name. And I realized this kept him from signing up to be a registered voter at that particular time. Later years, he didn't have to do that. And the first time that he and my mom could sign up and not have to just sign their name to the paper, I took them. 
and they signed up and became registered voters. The landscape was changing, but the work was nowhere near complete. Demonstrators took to Aniston's streets, demanding more jobs for blacks as frontline workers in stores and restaurants. Schools continued being an issue. 1971. More court-ordered integration sent 190 new black students to Welburn High School. As the center of a tight-knit working-class community, the high school was steeped in longtime traditions, traditions many locals did not want erased. Tensions increased when the new students demanded immediate acceptance as cheerleaders, athletes, and class officers. Battle lines were drawn. When a black student was suspended, about 60 students started a disturbance. There was some damage and classes were dismissed early. The next day, about half of the black students and many parents staged a demonstration outside the school, led by Reverend John Nettles, the same man who organized downtown marches calling for the hiring of more blacks in stores and restaurants. He was just 28 and determined to help bring change. Police were called and they were ordered to disperse. The order fell on deaf ears. Some 136, including Reverend Nettles, were arrested and taken to jail. The first time I went to jail uh, was uh, loaded on a school bus from Walter Weber High School with three bus loads of parents and students uh, end up going to the county jail. So for me, that was, that, that was the beginning and the center focus of the civil rights when I relate back personally, uh, that's what it was for me. I ended up sharing the cell with Reverend John Nettles, who I didn't know. And, uh, and of course, after that time, I ended up working for him and become best friends. Uh, and he said to me, he said, man, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, we're going to, they locked us up, and we're going to stay in here a while because they got to feed us. We're going to make them pay for locking us up, even with the food. I said, OK, man, that's a good idea. I didn't really know him that well, didn't know how he think. I said, that's a good idea. It's Thursday. He said, uh, we'll get out in time to make it to church Sunday in the morning. I said, oh, wait. <laughs> a little longer than I had planned on being there. The following day, over 100 black students and their parents crowded the school board offices. Their demands included a return of the suspended student, amnesty for the students who had taken part in the disturbance at the school, the firing of the school principal, and something else. They wanted an end to the band playing Dixie and the use of the Confederate flag at school activities. A day later, the school board backed the principal and voted to expel the student. Battle lines that were drawn earlier got deeper. It did not affect just Welburn. It was affecting the entire city. Aniston was a powder keg. That night, Reverend Nettles worked in his study at Mount Olive Baptist Church. The sounds of shots fired into his home next door jolted him. The bullets barely missed his wife, Gertrude, and their four-year-old daughter. Uh, Reverend, I can remember when they shot in his house. Uh, that was during the time we was marching. And uh, the people uh, down south out at South Anderson, everybody was getting their guns, and everybody was standing saying, you know, we were, we were going to protect uh, Reverend Ellis at his house. It was a time of high anxiety throughout the country. Black volunteers armed themselves and surrounded the Nettles' home. They said, we need some guys to come down and God protect Reverend Nettles because they done shot in his house. At that point, it was, it was fired up. It was at the edge to be like Cleveland, like Barton, like out in the West Coast. Gunfire erupted in the black neighborhoods of South and West Aniston. 
firebombs were tossed through the night and the early hours of the next morning. The next day was strangely quiet, but then came Sunday. October 31st, Halloween, 1971. Reverend Nettles addressed a mass meeting at the 17th Street Baptist Church calling for an end to the violence. Reverend Nettles, Reverend Nettles, they come out and they talk. They say, well, you know, we're not going to fight fire with fire, you know. Let's, let's pray about this. You know, they brought this religion thing and say, hey, but at the time, a lot of us didn't want to hear that. Now, nah, we're going to get them, you know. He said, no, nah, I'm okay. You know, my family's fine. He said, we don't, you have no idea who it was. You go out there, I don't want nobody to get in trouble, you know. He said, let this, let this go. It turned out to be anything but a peaceful night. There were at least six fire bombings and numerous shootings. When the Anniston Police Department's third shift began, they staged a sit-in. City Manager William Kell refused to allow the officers to wear or display riot gear. The officers wanted full protection. Mayor Clyde Pippen urged the officers to go on duty and help restore order. They continued sitting on the steps of the police station. Finally, Pippen gave in to the demands. He called in backups from around the state. Monday, November 1st. 50 to 75 state troopers arrived and sealed off a nearly 40 block section of South Anniston in an effort to prevent armed blacks from leaving the area. If the chaos of the city was to be brought under control though, a steadying force was needed to provide fresh leadership for the police department. Local businessman Gerald Powell was the perfect choice. He had served as interim sheriff earlier. He was a former federal alcohol and tobacco tax agent. He was respected by many officers. Reluctantly, he agreed to accept the newly created position of assistant administrator for police affairs for a salary of $1 per year. He promised and delivered a higher level of professionalism and equal enforcement of the law. He continued to serve until he found his own replacement highly respected state officer, Major Bill Jones. The two brought a new discipline to the police department. That alone was not enough. Trust did not exist between neighborhood leaders and city officials. That would require a bold move that came in the form of a biracial organization that would include black and white leaders. Newspaper editor H. Brant Ayers and WDNG's Tom Potts convinced businessman Hoyt Howell Sr. to help form this group. They knew leading citizens would attend a meeting and listen to Howell. Cool was, uh, was a, was a, it met every Tuesday morning and there was the black leadership and the white leadership. I guess a double dozen, um, and uh, the first uh, order of business was, is there a crisis in the community? Uh, if there was really something brewing, uh, we would talk that through. Uh, it was an agency for making changes. Howell presented what Ayers later described as a crisis management plan that infused the audience with a sense of urgency. It would tap the true resources of the community, its people. The organization came to be known as COOL, which stood for Community of Unified Leaders. Potts was elected chair and Reverend Nettles vice chair. Um, it wasn't just through COOL, but it was through COOL's uh, example. I think, uh, because there were uh, leaders from the black community and the white community sharing time and, and, and lunch with each other, um, trying to find common ground. And they did that, and it was a, an ongoing conversation. And as long as people are talking, they don't have to agree with everything, 
But as long as they're talking, chances are they're, they're, things aren't going to escalate to the point that you have a lot of violence. If you don't have that conversation, so if Cool hadn't been there, like you're suggesting, I don't know there had been another vehicle available for those conversations to take place, and I think things would have boiled over just like they did in every place else around us. In a 1972 letter, Gerald Powell noted the climate created by Cool. It is quite evident to me that no amount of law enforcement, coercion, or arbitration could have prevented a disastrous confrontation without the influence that Cool has exerted. In the following years, the community of unified leadership did much to heal the racial divide by creating job training programs and convincing downtown shops to hire African-American employees in front-end positions. Many battles were fought and won. The hope of those who were there is for future generations to know what they have did not come without a price. How you gonna solve a problem if you don't know the problem? How you gonna forget about something you don't really know all about? If you, if you wanna make it better, you discuss it. If you are afraid to discuss it, you must wish the same. If, it don't bother me to talk about it, cause that's history. I mean, it happened. We all done some things in our past we're not proud of, but it happened. And a lot of people at the point in time now say, hey, let's talk about it, let's get it out, and let's move on, because that'll never happen again. We'll never go back to that. So let's join hands and, you know, and try to live together as people, as one. Uh, now, Jesus said you have to forgive even your enemies and do good to those who despitefully use you. I, um, and I, I take the position that Martin took, you know, we, we, we fight hate with love. Uh, I would want to tell people that uh, um, you have reason for, for pride um, in, in what this city accomplished in those years. Uh, and they were, they were difficult and dangerous and, uh, and even deadly um, actions. Uh, but uh, this city never lost heart, never lost its head. I think today, I want to say we've improved and we have. I don't want to go back. Uh, I'm doing things that I didn't think I'd ever do before. I'm proud to be a part of the museum board. I'm learning. I may not be all that I should be or able to do, but I'm learning and it's an opportunity for me to grow. It's an opportunity for younger generations to see that you can do things. Um, life to me is, has improved, but I think we still have a long way to go. I would like for young people to know their history so you don't repeat it, and older too, and to take up the mantle and to try to make it better but making it better today may not work in the same ways that it worked. We may have to learn to have more skill for people in a different way who know how to negotiate, who know how to compromise, who know how to sit around tables and change things with establishments to prepare themselves, to even run for offices, to be in positions that I couldn't hold a long time ago, so it's a challenge that I would say is that in unity there is strength, and we must remember that the journey of a thousand miles began with one single step. Keep moving in the right direction. In the right direction, I think we're traveling in the right direction. And we may not go as fast as we want to go, but we got to keep time and recognize everybody as a person and govern self. I believe it was, it was Socrates said, know thyself. And Plato says, it's harder to govern thyself than it is a city. First, let me do right as a person. Well, I'm black, white, green, or whatever color I am. Let me try to do right. Let it be in me to do the right thing. And I think, and keep moving. Still a lot of progress needs to be made, but uh... We're moving.
Where am I going? I waste money sometimes. Going into a restaurant. Just to hear them say, can I help you, sir? God Almighty. Hmm. So now, I just go to say, may I help you, sir? And to leave out of that front door. And so I want to say thank you. Come back, please. That's so far from that back one no, that I used to go to. So far from that back door. I have stuff handed out to me. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. And if we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr.